Great. Everyone, we're ready to start. Thank you for coming today. Today, our speaker is Dr. Raisa Guerra. Uh, she is a biologist from the University of Brasilia with a master's degree in public policies and sustainable development and a PhD in natural resources from the University of Florida, where she analyzed the potentialities to implement payments for ecosystem services projects in the Amazon region. Currently, she is a researcher at the Amazon Environmental Research Institute, or EPOM, uh, where she's involved in drawing strategies to reach zero deforestation in the Amazon forest. So let's welcome our speaker. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I'm very, very glad to be here and presenting this talk with us and us. Short said, my name is Raissa, Raissa Guerra, and I work for IPAM uh, in Brazil. And one of the main missions of IPAM is to uh, produce, is the production of scientific studies, is the final goal to influence public policy. So, I mean, the first station in the Amazon um, is one of the issues, is one of the topics. That is, IPA has been with uh, since the beginning of the institution 21 years ago. So, uh, me and Paul, Dr. Paulo Moutinho, we are involved in many discussions, in many groups, and many NGOs are like developing some documents in order to pressure, in order to convince the government, especially now in this moment of crisis in Brazil, and we develop uh, some guidelines to definitely stop and avoid deforestation in the, the region. So uh, this uh, paper, I mean, this work uh, is a paper, Achieving Zero Deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon, what do you think? that has been just published at the Elementor Journal here, which is, I think, from California? I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's uh, an uh, international journal. So I will start my presentation asking for some contributions from um, you. Please help me to answer this question. Why should we stop deforestation in the end? After what, why do you think it, it is important to, to stop? Please, <laughs> I'm going to change. What else? So, one contribution. I'm going to show you some few numbers and probably all of you are right, and it's sort of a combination of all of these. Uh, in the Amazon, we have 50% of the global biodiversity, and this map shows two Amazons. I mean, it's just it's only one, but there is a geopolitical uh, separation limit. So the light green. It's the Brazilian Amazon. This combined with this other green is the international Amazon. And so uh, this region, in this region, around 50% of the global biodiversity uh, lives. <laughs> and we have 25% of the global carbon core which corresponds to 175 billion of tons of carbon, data from 2005, oh, a little bit of the, and the size of the, this is just the Brazilian Amazon, is 5,000, 5, 5 billion, 500, <laughs> <laughs> square kilometers, which corresponds to 7% of the planet, more or less um, half of the United States. And 25 million people live in the Amazon. And the majority now live in the urban areas, but we still have many traditional people and indigenous groups that live 
around 30% that live in the rural areas of the Amazon. And fortunately, around 43% of this population of these people are below the poverty line. <coughs> around <coughs> indigenous people live in the Amazon. And even with a lot of important reasons to stop the forestation, we are dealing already with around 10% of the deforested Amazon region, unfortunately. And so, um, why this? <laughs> Just because things, uh, I mean, those aren't, it's important, sorry, but those are development plans that have been implemented by the federal governments since before the dictatorship. So we can see here, Juscelino Kubitschek, Plano de Metas, those were three dictators in the superior dictator period, and Gaza, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, Lula, Dilma, those are different governments, but they have in common the fact that the Amazon region was important for the development, but important not, I mean, the, the, the goal was not to develop the Amazon, to develop the region, to make the lives of people that live there better, but the goal was to implement uh, investment in infrastructure and to meet the interests of the country, of the Brazil. And so during the last 50 years, 60 year, years, people, local people are a, sort of uh, abundant. Of course, we have differences, slightly different things. But the main goal was to build dams, for example, to provide energy for the south of the country and to build highways to transport commodities for outside of the country and people, the companies from the south of the country who uh, had profits and benefited. But for the local people, the situation is still complicated. And that's why in 2006, Daniel Nett said, made a, a model. I mean, if we keep doing the same as we were doing uh, until 2050, the deforestation, which is the yellow, would attain the Amazon in almost half a percent of the territory of the Amazon. So this was in 2006 when um, many institutions and international institutions were concerned about the situation at the end. And fortunately, uh, the government woke up a little bit. And if we can see, if we can compare the year 2000, when we had a total of 133 million of hectares of protected areas, I'm sorry, Something happened here. But indigenous lands and protected areas are the yellow and the green spreads. Yeah. No, sorry. I mean, the green and the other green are the indigenous lands and the protected areas. And we can see a difference between 2000 and 2013, which is at this time it was 120. 3 million hectares, and 13 years later, this number almost doubled in terms of creation of protected territories in the Amazon. Why is this important? Because we know already that protected areas, indigenous lands, uh, yeah, the deforestation almost does not happen in this place. It happens majority of the deforestation, which is ongoing in the Amazon region, happens outside of protected areas. So this is an average, of course, in the indigenous lands, we have 1% uh, of the indigenous lands are already the forest, sustainable use lands, around 30%. So it's important to maintain, to keep, to create 
protected areas, which is a strong tool that provides sort of a preservation. Even if uh, in Brazil we have some issues of monitoring, some problems to control and some invasions, but even the fact, the single fact that creating protected areas, it avoids lots of threats to this thing. Let's go back to the mining thing. This is a graph that shows a little bit the evolution of the forestation in the Amazon since the beginning of the night. So we can see that uh, the average of the forestation since 94 until 2004, the average was around 19,000 square kilometers. And because the government woke up, <laughs> as I said, and implemented uh, low enforcement campaigns, restricted the credit to the forest, so producers will have to much more difficult to, um, to have credits for the government to raise cattle or to plant crops. And of course, the establishment of new protected areas we were able to drop the forestation rates from around 70%. So from the average per year of 19,000 square kilometers, and now the average is more or less 5,000 square kilometers, which is great achievement. But the question is, fair enough, do you think it, even if it's a great achievement, there is still the forest in around 5,000 football per year. What do you think? Is that, uh, can we keep doing this? No. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. We are doing the same. We keep doing the same as we were doing here. But the difference is that the pace is just oh. We are doing the same to forest in the areas are being threatened, but in a lower pace. So instead of finishing the Amazon 2040 or 50, we will be doing this 20 years later. So, of course, uh, there are many relationships between deforestation and degradation. There are many studies that relate this to climate change. One example is from a researcher from Nippon, Divino Silverio. He, he made a study about, he, he was interested in understanding the changes of the temperature inside an indigenous area. This is the park indígena do Xingu, in Mato Grosso State, here with the black one. And he made a, a study comparing the temperature inside the park and outside of the park. So this is, those are the limits of the park. And the difference during 10 years, since 2000 and 2010, was, I mean, uh, around seven degrees, on average, seven degrees Celsius inside and outside of the park, which is much hotter inside of the park. So this is very, um, Important because we have no brain, we have no force, we have no brain, and the muscle transpiration mechanism will change, and definitely we will have some changes in the rainfall systems. I mean, in, if we don't have brain, we don't have crops in the populations, like threatened, and also even the large producers are having some trouble in Mato Grosso State. They are having feeling like some difficulties because of the lack of the rain in soil implantation. So this is a threat, I think, by not me. <laughs> this is just an example of how uh, could be, how negative could be the lack of forest for, for population. Those are uh, his data. From 2000 to 2010, these are the temperatures, average of temperatures inside the parking indigenous of Xingu, 
and outside of the machine. And so this is basically if we want to tackle this kind of climate change into the climate change, one of the responsible for these would be the deforestation and degradation. So let's also tackle deforestation and degradation. And of course, I could stay here talking about many, many reasons that provoke deforestation in the Amazon currently, but we have enough for men, for men threats are responsible for the largest part of the deforestation going in the Amazon. And in this paper, we focus it more on these five threats, which are, first of all, there's, there's a I'm sorry. So, uh, Belo Dam was supposed to be here. <laughs> a very destroyed area of Belo Monte. And here is a, it's a road. So, we, uh, there are many, many projects to build roads, highways, and interest in dams. The Amazon right now. And the issue that we don't have too much protocols that are being followed by the large company. So they, they build the way they want, even sometimes there are some pressures and they find a way to build. And so we know that the roads, for example, if when we build a, build a road in the Amazon, 50%, 50% Kilometers of each side of the road will be deforested in a few years. And concerning the dams, uh, we have already, there's no kilometers, but other than 991 dams already in the Amazon basin, and they are planning to build 246 more in the basin. In the, just in the Tapajos River, 43 days. So, um, can you imagine if, how difficult it would be to deal with the role of the infrastructure uh, projects? And so, this is to show a little bit the impacts of building a road. Hold on a state in the Amazon. In 1997, we can see uh, the PR364, and a few years later, these are the rural settlements, the deforestation that is ongoing on the side of the road. A few years later, we feel the difference <coughs> in terms of deforestation. So, let's go back. The yellow is the deforestation. Seven years later, we have very high impact station on each side of the BR364. And so uh, the second threat are the, yeah, those are main drivers of the station. <laughs> 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 the second threat, uh, which is not negligible, or the demand for commodities. And so here is a soybean plantation. And the, the most important commodities for the Amazon are soybean and cattle ranching. And there is 2006, the Brazilian federal government made an agreement, established an agreement with the main, main the most important buyers of soybean in the world, Argil, Hungi. And the idea was that these companies would not buy, that means they would not buy soybean from the area that has just been deforested. This was called the <coughs> soy moratorium. And then the government renewed this agreement. The idea was to, that the duration was supposed to be 10 years until 2006 now, but the, due to the positive impacts of the Disagreement, they renew it until no limited time. Uh, and now they estimate that the soybean that comes from the forest <coughs> are around 50%. So, uh, 
sorry. I don't like too much the sorry be the, the moratorium because this is personal. Because before the before before the, the soybean plantation, uh, they put cattle. So here the area is already deforested, it's fine. So not they, they never deforest to put soybean directly. So I mean sort of a controversial the positive impact of this agreement, but it, it is something. I imagine that if it didn't have the, the moratorium, it could be worse. And then the idea is to uh, spread this moratorium for other commodities, to implement for commodities such as other crops or maize or rice and cattle ranching. And it could be could work. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the government uh, is like against this idea because the market and the way that the government, the, the, the country would probably lose. The third main treat, which is it's not in order, <laughs> this is probably the first main treat to the Amazon, are the rural settlement. Sorry. And um, the rural settlements are responsible for 30% of the ongoing forestation in Canada. And we can see here a rural settlement in Rondon in 1975, and the impacts of these fish bones, I mean, they're like opening areas to produce. And 15 years, 16 years later, of course, those people they uh, deserve a much better condition to live and to survive and the government should be um, providing the economic assistance to not the forest places that should not be the forest and promote the promoting sustainable production conditions for them and instead of just opening an area and putting in this place but there the, on the other hand the government does not have the conditions to deal with this. That's the argument. But this is a very important point because 30% of the ongoing deforestation right now is due to the creation of the process and establishing the Amazon. Another very important uh, threat are the, the agribusiness lobby that we have at the National Congress, which are opposed forces, forces against the frustration. They want, they want to develop development in mind. So the some laws are circulating from circulating circulating the National Congress. One of them is the PECI 215, which is a constitutional amendment. And the, if this if this amendment is approved in the, the, the law in the, the Congress, there are some studies predicting that the deforestation will increase. I mean, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that with this amendment, the government, the National Congress, will be able to reduce the, the size of the already, the already created indigenous land. And the Egyptian people will lose many rights in terms of uh, controlling their areas. So that's why it's a threat because if they back it up. So there are some studies from the University of Chicago and IPA that uh, predicted that around 4,800 words per kilometer and many millions of emissions of. <coughs> Uh, so this is very important and except for some NGOs, nobody is taking too much attention on this. And finally, one um, very important threat are the um, designated public forest land that both federal and state uh, government, the Amazon, have, which are the designated. Forest lands. 
So we can see in black, those are lands from the government that does not have yet uh, a function. They could be designated to the creation of settlements, or protected areas, or more indigenous lands. But the, meanwhile, they are not, they are still discussing what we doing with plants. And meanwhile, lots of people are invading in the environment. So instead of rushing and creating more uh, conditions and, and creating more protected areas, they're just escaping and this land is are being invaded. So around 64 million of hectares here are still could be better used for preservation purposes, which is not happening. And yeah, those are the five main important questions that we're dealing with. And that's all. <laughs>